So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started with the lightning talks now. Um, the first one is Ian McLeod. Thank you. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Oh, okay. I hope the demo works. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm going to talk about Fedora on the Raspberry Pi Zero. I'm calling this bootstrapping an old architecture. I'm sure you've seen or heard some talks about bootstrapping new architectures that are fast and interesting, like PowerPC 64 or 64-bit ARM. So we're going to go in the opposite direction here. So who has heard of the Raspberry Pi, as if I'm not OK? Who knew about this device, the Raspberry Pi Zero? So most of you. OK, good. That's probably why you're here. Um, it is a one gigahertz, half a gigabyte, full Linux computer that fits in the palm of at least this hand. Um, how many of you knew that the Raspberry Pi is actually a GPU chip with a CPU put onto it as an afterthought? Just some of it. It is. That's what it is. I think uh, something like only two or three percent of the die space on these chips is the ARM CPU, and the rest of it is actually a GPU that is used in mobile phones. That is one of the reasons why it's able to be manufactured so cheaply, or at least that's my understanding. Um, this invocation, or incarnation of it rather, has an HDMI connector. It has a single USB OTG connector, a different connector for power. And then it has the same 40 pins for GPIO that the rest of the Pi family have. So the original Raspberry Pi uh, and the Raspberry Pi 2, uh, this duplicates all of that. And it costs five US dollars if you can find one. Uh, like a, rest, a lot of the rest of the Pis, it's not very easy to find at the moment. If you're willing to buy $55 of other stuff with it, Adafruit in the United States will ship one to you. That is how I managed to get my hands on one right now. Um, so you've, who's heard of the chip? The $9 computer. So if that's too rich for your blood, the Raspberry Pi Zero is the machine for you. It's only five. Uh, and it's made in Wales. Who's heard of Wales? I'm just kidding. We'll move on to that. So what? <laughs> what? Cheap will run Fedora, exactly. Why would we be interested in this? The Raspberry Pi has been a phenomenally successful platform. Uh, they, have, they shipped 5 million units uh, through February of last year. I can't find any more recently. I think they are. They just blow away any other platform. This is a check-in app that not everybody uses, but it gives you a, stent, a sense of the ge geographical extent of their community. There are five in Antarctica that have checked in. There, is, uh, there are two on the International Space Station. Uh, some other reasons why. Did I mention they have five million units in production out there being used, right? It's a very large community of developers and users and has a very large focus on education, which I think is always a good place uh, to have a presence. Um, they are not open hardware. They haven't done everything that we would ideally like to see them do as a community, but in my personal opinion, their motivations are good, right? They are a not-for-profit foundation. They've been associated with education for a long time. A lot of them were involved in the original BBC microcomputer back in the 1980s. So they've cut their teeth on it. Uh, I think they're a pretty good player in this space. Uh, and another reason for me to be interested in personally in doing this Fedora recompile is because there's really no or very minimal Fedora presence in the community. There was a project called Pydora. They did some releases based on Fedora 18, 19, and 20. They were partial rebuilds. And it, for all intents and purposes, appears to be pretty much dead. They have not updated since then. It's been difficult to get in touch with them. There's some interest in the Raspberry Pi 2 in Fedora 24. Peter Robinson talked about this. Uh, that's not going to be quite the same thing, and we'll see why in a minute. Why is it not yet supported? Why is Fedora not yet supported on this? The original Pi and this device, the Pi Zero, are ARM v6 CPUs. It is an older version of the ARM CPU architecture. It is not binary compatible, forward compatible. You can't run v7, basically. You can't run the current Fedora builds are too new to run on it. They also require a forked kernel at the moment, although that is changing. Thank you. Uh, and they require a binary bootloader blob. So what have I done to make this work so far? I have, since early December, done mock and then mock chain rebuilds of about 3,000 of the core packages in Fedora. Um, and these are the binary packages. Most of Fedora is actually non -ar no architecture, right? Uh, I did use Pydora to bootstrap it. I am mostly unshackled from that now. Um, an interesting thing to know about this is that the v6 architecture is actually an almost perfect strict subset of v7, which means that I can use newer, faster machines to compile the v6 stuff using mock and mock to roots, right? It has been a very time-consuming process. I was warned about this by many people who have done it before, many people in Fedora release engineering. But it has been very rewarding and very interesting. I've learned a tremendous amount about what goes into Fedora. 
A few random thoughts, don't have a whole lot of time, but if you're going to do this yourself, disable the check section. Be aware that build requires don't always have to work. You can fake them. And in this particular case, you can, when, it's, when you're really in a pinch, you can be on the ARM v7 architecture, but say that you want to build the RPM for the other target, and it mostly works. Be careful if you do something like that. Um, the other thing I've done with some help from Mike McLean is I have what I think is the smallest Koji cluster in the world, the smallest build system. It sits on top of a little shelf in my, uh, in my uh, office. I have seven builders, and I'm going to be using those to do the work that's next, hopefully with some help. So I need to complete the first pass of these package builds. I need to do a remix and rebranding, um, finish up with the updates in Rawhide, and I want to leave myself enough time to try and turn it on. So uh, I won't even mention the rest of these. So let's see if it works. Does anyone want to see if it works? OK. Let's do a demo. So if I switch this to HDMI and I plug this power in, we should see, with any luck, I figured if there was any audience for which I could get a round of applause for a boot to text mode on a system, <laughs> this would be it. So it takes, it's not the fastest machine in the world. just to give a sense of how much is here and how much is left to do. It should eventually say that there's almost 400 packages. And it takes a while. It takes five minutes for the initial DNF command to run, actually, uh, on this device. So uh, yeah, and uh, here, we'll do Etsy Fedora release. Although I have to remove that and rebrand it with something else, Pete Robinson told me. So, go to my Fedora People page, I'm a cloud, uh, Fedora People, and uh, in a subdirectory called ARM SBCs, uh, the image that is running on this is there. And I'm working on getting the rest of the recompiles up. If you want to be involved in the recompile, if you want access to the Koji system, come talk to me as well. Is there any questions? You. Uh, I think the Panda board is another v7 machine. You, you can, and in fact, the way that the Raspberry Pi people do things right now is they have an ARM v6 user space that runs on everything, even the Raspberry Pi 2, and then they just sort it out with the bootloader. I don't think you would want to run it on anything else. I think the, it can run, yeah, upstream Fedora. This is a question. In the back. It will. In fact, I tested it on a Raspberry Pi original before I got my hands on a zero. So it will. They're the same, they are the same chip, as a matter of fact. Mike, you had a question. Can you run it under virtualization on SBC? And would that be faster? Um, it's not faster. It's definitely not faster than any of the machines you can. It used to be comparable when we had only single core ARM boards, but it's not fast. Because I talked about that. Maybe you can make a build farm out of QMU instances. Um, but no, it's not fast. You can. I don't think there's a way to simulate strict ARMv6 on QMU, as best I can tell. But I could be wrong. Jay. What was the most interesting or clever base build requirement? I think I noticed that the Perl package upstream actually does this every time it revs the version. There's a swing version where it pretends that it can support either version of the API. Um, that was about it. There's so many of them. It's, you know, <laughs> in theory, this should be something that you know how to, I'm out of time. Thank you. All right, cheers. You've got to do a graceful shutdown, of course, otherwise. No. <laughs>
but let's go this way first. We'll right? just timer. It's just the timer. Oh, okay. So oh shit! We were going to do your slide. <laughs> <laughs> Time is ticking. That's why I didn't bring my laptop. So welcome to the next speaker. Hello. Just this one, yeah. No, it's not gonna work. I'll do it. So I'll, well, that's a lot of things. I'll talk about reproducible builds, what they are, and the stages. It's a very, very quick one. So I'm not doing Debian stuff. That's boring. This work is done by all these people. I'm just one of them. Um, who are you, is the question. Who are here to talk about reproducible builds already? So not so many, that's good. Um, motivation, why do we do this? This was well described by Mike uh, Perry and Seth Schoen at the um, last, con not the last, but one congress. I just summarize it shortly, really watch this talk, it's really good. They had a remote ro root exploit in SSH where the difference in the binary was one single bit in a 500 kilobyte binary. So if you flip a bit, you get root exploit. They also had a kernel module which modified the source in memory and not on disk. So you look at the file on disk, it's all fine, the source is fine, you compile it, you've got vector inside. Then think about the amount of money some entities have, like the censorship, the budget, the censorship budget of Iran is $100 million. Is your infrastructure good enough to sustain attackers which have such, so many resources? It's really, I go through it very briefly because it's a long talk and I'll just summarize it here. And you leave your computers alone and USB 3 has direct memory access, so there's ways to get into your machine and you really don't know what you're running. So that, yeah, <coughs> we try to address this. Um, and another example from real life, so the CIA made a paper describing how they put a Trojan into an SDK which developers download and which will the sources are fine, but there's a backdoor in the binaries created. And this was found in the wild last year, Xcode Ghost, which was a thing um, for Apple iOS. And the servers were slow, so, so somebody had said faster servers, and these servers were backdoored. If you build applications, you're doomed. And WeChat for XOS was affected by it. 20 million users got rooted. So this happens in the real world. And our solution is that we promise that everybody can recreate the same binary from the same source. Anybody should be able to do this. And we call this reproducible builds. So if there's bit by bit identically, we call that reproducible builds. And we <coughs> I had a demo, which I skipped. So what I show in the demo, I built a Debian package five times and get five times a different checksum. And whoa, what did I press? You don't know, okay. <laughs> so I skipped the demo because it takes too long, but now I will back. And so when you build it five times, you get five times the depth with the same checksum. It's really, really simple. It's all the same. And you don't have to look inside the Debian archive. You just see it on the checksum outside. And we think this should really be the norm. All free software should be built that way. Actually, we think it should only be called free software. It's, it's binary reproducible. And there's more benefits than security. 
Smaller deltas gives you faster updates if you do binary delta updates. In Debian, we've seen lots of QA efforts, like we found strange bugs, like we found packages which will fail to build in the future. Of course, we test building in the future, so we can build with different dates. So we found lots of things. Google does reproducible builds for security, of course, but also they save developer time, and developer time is money, because developers wait for the builds to finish, and they can cache more. Um, so what we've done, we've set up now, we started with the Debian Wiki, which Debian Wiki still has some good information, but three months ago, I think, we started this reproducible-build.org webpage, which describes why and has documentation how to address common issues and also list projects working on it. If you haven't gone there, please go there. Um, lots of issues are described in, by Luna in his talk at the CCC camp this last year, um, where he describes issues and how to fix them. Um, so for example, g sub minus n is one thing. You want sorting is depending on the locale, which mocks the address in the Fedora case, but in other cases not. So this talk really has lots of information. If you want to see a video, watch this video. It has nice things. Um, the most common problem is timestamps. Mostly it's not so much really in binaries, though some binaries do have it, but it's the documentation tools, so PyDoc and Pandoc and whoever, they all put timestamps in the documentation they generate. And mostly these timestamps are also um, changed by time zones or locales, um, which again in the mock case mock normalizes the environment, so that's fine. But we look at also at the upstream thing, and some people don't normalize the environments. And there's very few other issues. Um, I'll come to that in a second. Debian, we have identified the issues. So there's not, these are really the issues time zones, timestamps, and locales. For the timestamp problem, we've invented source state epoch, um, which is defined as the last modification of the source code. Um, that can be used instead of the current date. It can um, in initialize the random seeds. In Debian, we set it from the last change log entry. Um, you can also use the date of the last git commit. And that is deterministic because it doesn't change. Um, and many upstream software supported, like we have a patch for GCC, which will get in hopefully in this development cycle of GCC. We've patched, I think, 30 or something softwares. And the BS, NetBSD and FreeBSD use it now. Geeks use it. Arch Linux. We have a patch for RPM build, which also uses it, I think. Um, we've written a spec, which is just two kilobytes of text or something. It's really short spec defining it. Um, and we've set up a test setup where we continuously test Debian testing unstable experimental. Um, but not by now, also Core Boot, OpenWRT, NetBSD, FreeBSD, Arch Linux, Fedora, and soon F-Droid and Geeks. At the moment, we are only building 800 Fedora packages. Not all. And this is running on nice big hardware. And you see there's the test with 29 contributors. There's about 10 out of these are not Debian people, but they are from other projects. Um, and what we do is we build twice, and in between we vary the environment, um, and then we compare the results. That is to find issues. So we, um, there's something, again, mock will normalize some environments, but other things not. What we're not testing at the moment is the file system. We've made a fuser file system. Um, which will, where readDR returns a random order and the block sizes are also random. So there you find, we find artifacts of this. We're not changing the CPU yet on AMD64. We do so. Oh, I'm out of time. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, eight minutes? Uh, 10 minutes and 20 seconds at the last time. Okay. Sorry. All right. I'll just one thing. <laughs> I tested it before, but I explained it to me. The status of Fedora, so we do test Fedora. We have patches, um, we have a repository, um, but it doesn't work yet. We need Fedora people to look into it. I'll be here tonight, tomorrow. Please talk to me. Thank you.
weapons. Okay, so it's time for the next speaker. So let's give a round of applause to Yuji. Can you hear me? Okay, so I've got 10 minutes, probably already less, to explain you why you should write upstream metadata for your application and plugins, and how you can easily make a defense. So uh, for the last 20 years, uh, uh, software app discoverability and uh, installation on Linux was mostly about uh, software uh, package managers. So on the, on the desktop, the experience is something like this. That's, that's Yamex. Uh, so we pretty much get a list of uh, packages with uh, the names of the packages and uh, short descriptions. If you search for something like instant messaging, uh, you get like nothing. So uh, I, as an experienced user, uh, enjoy working with package managers. If you know what you want to install, that's like uh, usually the, uh, the most effective way uh, to get it done. On the other hand, for new and average users who are now where they used to, uh, like app stores and uh, Google Play and, and such uh, catalogs, uh, this is something that completely puzzles them. So to stay in the game, we had to come, uh, come up with something similar. So uh, one of the apps, uh, that this, this is from the uh, GNOME project, is GNOME software, which is like, as you can see, like a classic catalog app. So if you, if you do the same search, uh, instant, yeah, you actually get some reasonable results, some useful results. So, but uh, where does the data come from? How it's, uh, the catalog is actually created? Uh, so this GNOME software, and also not, not only GNOME, but also KDE Muon, which is a catalog for, for KDE, and also Ubuntu uh, software center is switching to the standard. All those projects are using uh, distro agnostic upstream XML format, so you can, you can find the specification on freedesktop.org. Uh, and the project is uh, uh, about writing metadata, not only for desktop apps, but also for add-ons, uh, fonts, codecs, and so on. I'd like to focus on the desktop applications and add-ons. Uh, so I'll show you right away how such uh, an XML file with metadata looks like. This is uh, XML file for Nautilus. It's not, it's not uh, the final version. Nautilus actually adds some more stuff when it's built, but I wanted to show this version because it's, it's clear there are no translations and stuff like that. So you see the, the ID that uh, needs to be the same as the desktop file of that application, that's identifier. You need to have a license for that metadata. I used to use uh, GNU documentation, uh, GNU free document license, but apparently some distributions like Debian uh, have a problem with this license and actually some projects I sent uh, the metadata to, had to, uh, had to uh, license it. So that's why I, in the end, ended up with uh, Creative Commons Zero, which is probably like the best, the best way to go uh, for this uh, metadata. Then you've got like a longer description. You can add uh, kudos, which is actually not defined in the uh, upstream specification, but it helps to sort uh, the applications, like uh, uh, to identify the quality of the application for the user. Uh, 
and also like uh, uh, home page of the project and so on. And then the final version looks like this. As you can see, you can also uh, add uh, localization, so you can hook it up to uh, your get text uh, system, transifex, whatever, and you can let uh, the translators translate also the metadata. Uh, it also adds, uh, is it somewhere here? You can also add uh, screenshots. Uh, the only thing I don't really like about the screenshots is that there is really no centralized repository for them, so you actually have to find some place where to locate the, the, those screenshots and the distributions, download them when they build uh, the database of applications. Uh, so I think this could be actually uh, improved, hopefully in the future. So once, once you have this, ideally you should, you should send it to uh, us, uh, the upstream project. The upstream project should ship it either like uh, install it uh, already in, the, in their built uh, scripts or they can also only include it in the tarball and then you can take care of it in the spec file in, uh, uh, in Fedora case. So I'll show you uh, such a spec file. Uh, so this is for example for uh, a plugin, uh, Telegram plugin for, uh, for Pigeon, you just here like Pretty much just copy the, uh, the XML file to uh, user share app data uh, path. Uh, you should also add uh, check here uh, that validates that the, the, the XML file actually uh, passes uh, the, uh, the standard. And uh, that's pretty much it. And Fedora, and I suppose other distribution has the similar thing, uh, runs uh, a script that looks for uh, those XML files in packages. Once it finds it, it builds the database, uh, connects the package with that uh, metadata, and uh, creates the data for GNOME software. And also I mentioned that you can write uh, metadata for add-ons as well. Uh, which are actually much easier to write. It's like fairly short XML file. It needs very short description. It doesn't require any screenshot, anything. Uh, so this, this takes like five minutes to write. And I started uh, an initiative uh, in Fedora to actually cover uh, the add-ons because we've covered the applications pretty well. But still, we, for example, have Nautilus in, in the catalog. But Nautilus has like 10 add-ons and the users don't know about them because the, the add-ons are not listed in the profile of Nautilus. So he, here you can actually contribute, you can write the XML file, you can uh, submit it upstream or you can submit it downstream as well if the upstream doesn't, uh, is, is, too, is too slow to accept it or uh, doesn't want to accept it. And that's how we can actually build uh, the metadata and the catalog even more. I'll just show you how it uh, looks. So one, once uh, the application has uh, meta, like plugins of that application have metadata, then they are listed. Uh, sorry for the localization, it's in check, but I, I suppose you understand. Uh, it's listed in the profile of the application. So the user immediately knows, yes, this, this software actually has some extensions that can be useful for me. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Thank you for your attention. Hey, thanks, Jurka, and welcome our next our last speaker for today, actually, Kevin.
I'm going to talk about Qt Web Engine, which I think is the future of web browsing. So first, uh, let me shortly introduce myself. I'm Kevin Kofra. I've been a Fedora packager since 2007. I maintain 46 packages currently. And my employer is Dagopt Optimization Technologies, GmbH. And I'm also doing a PhD in mathematics. So what is Qt Web Engine? It's a new web engine that is available in Qt 5 since version 5.4. It has been reasonably feature complete since uh, 5.6, which is about to be released. There is already beta available. And it's available in Fedora, at least in Rawhead. I will come to that later. It's a replacement for Qt Web Kit, but not really. It's not a drop-in replacement. But the way it works is that Qt Web Kit has been deprecated since Qt 5.5. It's still available, but it's no longer actively maintained. And Qt Web Engine is based on Google's Chromium, which is nice because it's modern, up to date, but the drawback is that it's hard to package. So why Qt Web Engine? Because the old Qt Web Kit was based on an old Web Kit branch, a really, really old one, which is no longer supported by upstream Web Kit. It's no longer up to date with the current web standards. And most importantly, even the security updates are too hard to backport, so no, there is missing a lot of security updates. And a rebasing to a newer web kit was not feasible because uh, the Qt project just did not have the resources for it. And the, they changed from WebKit 1 to WebKit 2. And WebKit 1 is no longer supported. And to support WebKit 2, uh, Qt WebKit would have to change a lot. And so they said, if we are going to have to change the old API anyway, we're going to just pick Chromium, which is modern, up to date with current web standards. And um, and they also backport security updates to the stable branch. Because uh, as you can see, Qt Web Engine 5.6 is based on Chromium 45, which is not the latest release, but they, they have backported all the security fixes that are relevant. Uh, it offers a complete API to build a full browser. There is already uh, one browser, which is called Capsilla, which uses it. Um, it supports all the modern HTML5 stuff. If you care about Flash, you can drop in the blob, but you have to do it yourself. It won't do it for you. And in the future, the next release, uh, which will be in about six months or so, will be Qt Web Engine 5.7. It will be based on a newer Chromium, at least 47. It will have all the features from above, of course, but in addition, it will also support printing. And there will also be an optional support for the blob that provides the EME DRM. But there, too, you have to install it yourself if you want to use it. Now, as a developer, how you would use it is there are two possibilities, either in C++ or in QML. And in QML, then you can use it directly or through a wrapper. In C++, there is this Q Web Engine view. C++ class is the most powerful uh, API. And that's you, what's what, for example, Capsilla 2 uses. Um, in QML, you can use Q, Qt Web Engine directly through a native API. That's the Web Engine View class. We, and the, it's nice because it's easy to integrate into a QML user interface, but the API is more limited than in C. Or then there is also a cross-platform wrapper, which is useful for mobile platforms where, where, where you don't have Qt Web Engine. Um, and it offers a similar API to the Web Engine view, but even more restricted, because it's restricted to the lowest common denominator that you have in uh, also in the native browser that's used on the mobile platforms. On the desktop platforms, it uses Qt Web Engine, at least on Linux. And the, the wrapper is not packaged yet in Fedora, but it's very small. Uh, so um, it, it's easy to package, which, which is just no app that, that needs it right now. Um, so uh, I packaged the Qt Web Engine. The package is called Qt 5 Qt Web Engine, like all the other Qt 5 modules. And uh, it was quite some work to, work to package it. I unbundled libraries whenever possible. There is some where Qt Web Engine 5.6 already does it. There are some others where Chromium supports unbundling, but uh, Qt Web Engine didn't do it. So I, uh, I made it do it. And 
yeah, there's some other small stuff I unbundled. Then uh, what was really annoying is that uh, Chromium removed support for x86 without SSE2. In Fedora, we're supposed to support uh, all the uh, x86 machines with only conditional move and no other additional instruction sets. And so uh, I restored the runtime detection that was there uh, in old versions of Chromium. I added some where there was new stuff, SSE2 stuff added. And the idea is that everything needs to be runtime detected because otherwise we'll slow down the, the SSE2 machines, which I don't want to do. And this works already. Uh, I'm now working on, on GStreamer support um, because there is GStreamer backend for Chromium by Samsung. And I'm trying to backward it to Qt Web Engine's Chromium, but it's not done yet. Yeah, and the package does not replace Qt WebKit, as I said. It's already available in raw ad, except GStreamer, which, which I'm still working on. And uh, for Fedora 22 and 23, if there is, will be a Qt 5.6 update, it will be included. Uh, but for now, you can get it from, from the copper. There is one for Qt 5.6, and I also have a dedicated one. Um, then there is Capzilla, which is a web browser that uses Qt Web Engine. Uh, at the, the current version, which will become Capsilla 2, uses Qt Web Engine instead of Qt Web Kit. Uh, right now, there is a snapshot from Git Master, um, which is already in Riot. It's a modern browser for end users. It can be an alternative to Firefox and to proprietary browsers like Google Chrome. And it has optimal desktop integration, unlike Firefox, for example just like the old Capsilla one, which was Qt WebKit based. Um, for example, it has native icons, native file dialogues. Uh, it, uh, it uses Qt, so it adapts to the style, or also for, to the Advaita style in GNOME. Uh, of course, to the Plasma one, because it's Qt. Um, it supports native notifications and so on. Uh, you can also use KWallet or GNOME Keyring, which is supported through plugins. And as I said, it's already in Riot, and I have a Qt Web Engine copper repository where you can get it for Fedora 22 and 23. It will not be in the official Fedora 22 and 23 updates because it replaces Capsilla 1, so it's a new major version. And so these are the links where you can find more information. This is uh, the change page, and the, then this is the copper where you can get it. And there are also links to in, on, on the change page to our upstream resources. So I think there is one minute and a half or so for questions. So are there any questions? Looks like not. Then, uh, <laughs> thank you for the applause and uh, enjoy the evening. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I'm not sure. I would have to bring it up in a VM. Uh, I don't, don't. Thank you.